Good afternoon. I'm Senior Associate Dean Norianne Sharp at the McDonough School of Business, and I welcome you this afternoon to one of our Stanton Distinguished Leader Series. We are grateful to have with us today a pioneer in the effort to integrate Jesuit ideals and principles into business practices. I was fortunate enough to meet Chris Lowney, I should say Dr. Lowney, this past July at a Jesuit business school dean's conference in Uruguay. Having read two of his books, Heroic Leadership and Heroic Living, I already knew before meeting him that Chris would be the ideal speaker to support our efforts and our mission to integrate the Jesuit concepts, principles, and ideals in our curriculum. When I invited him to speak, was not sure what he would say, but he was grateful and generously accepted my invitation to come and speak to you all this fall. Chris Lowney chairs the board of CHI, one of, nations, one of our nation's largest healthcare systems with more than 100 hospitals. He formerly served as managing director of J.P. Morgan in New York, Tokyo, Singapore, and London until leaving the firm in 2001. He has lectured in more than two dozen countries on leadership, business ethics, and other related topics. He's the author of a total of four books, including the best-selling Heroic Leadership and Heroic Living. Heroic Leadership has been transformed into a dozen languages. His latest work is Pope Francis, Why He Leads the Way He Leads. He's a one-time Jesuit seminarian, a graduate of Fordham University, where he received both his bachelor's and his master's degrees. And he is a holder of a total of five honorary doctoral degrees. I know you will enjoy what he has to say. Please join me in welcoming Chris Lowney. Okay, so let me thank uh, Dr. Sharp for the opportunity to speak to you. And for me, uh, really, it's an honor and a privilege. I'm not doing a favor. Um, you're all doing a favor by coming. Um, and uh, I only have about uh, 20 minutes to chat, so I hope you don't mind if we jump right in. And why don't we start uh, thinking about leadership with a little survey. Um, let's think about the world today and the world, I don't know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. You think the world today is faster paced than the world has been. Why don't you raise your hand? All right, that's 97.2%. If you think that the world today is more complex than the world then, why don't you raise your hand? And if you think in the course of managing your life or managing an organization, you'd have to cope with more change or make more decisions, why don't you raise your hand? Okay, this seems ridiculous, but somehow it's important because this is why we need to talk about leadership. I started working at J.P. Morgan in 1983, and in 1983, if we used the word leadership, probably what came to our mind was Lou Preston. That was the chief executive at J.P. Morgan. And in 1983, it was still barely imaginable that you know, one person or even a, group, a small group of people could make all of the important decisions that had to be made, even in a big multinational like Morgan. Um, and uh, could represent the organization where it had to be represented. And then in the course of the late 80s and 90s and certainly 21st century, the world became like this. And the idea that you know, one person or, or one small group of people is going to do all the things that are needed in order to lead an organization is, is lunacy. And so you get into environments like this, then you really need wide, widespread uh, leadership. And I wonder how we feel about the quality of leadership we actually have. Let me invite you to do a little more thinking. Uh, there was a survey that was done a, a, um, a few years ago, and a public relations firm asked people if they had a great deal of confidence in the leadership of certain sectors of society. Let's duplicate the survey. Let's see how you feel. Uh, if you have a great deal of confidence in our political leaders, why don't you raise your hand? Whoa, microphone failure. <laughs> All right, you have a great deal of confidence in our business leaders, why don't you raise your hand? Yeah, of course, you're, you're all in the business school. You have a great deal of confidence in our education leaders, why don't you raise your hand? Look at that. We'll ask Dr. Sharp to leave, then we'll have a real vote. <laughs> and finally, uh, you have a great deal of confidence in our religious leaders, why don't you raise your hand? 
Man, you're pretty pessimistic down here in DC. <laughs> I'm from New York City. We're the land of the great optimist. <laughs> Let me show you what was the correct answer to the survey. Uh, I won't comment. You can really see yourself. <laughs> And look, friends, this was 2007, huh? like when the world was still relatively OK. So, <laughs> so we can imagine if this were, were done again today, surely all of these numbers would have to be lower. You know, it's hard to imagine why anybody would feel better. So in terms of the story we're creating together, we seem to agree that we live in a world that's complex and fast changing in those environments. You really need good leadership. We don't feel very good about the quality of leadership we have. And I wonder what would be better. What would be better? So what if we just took a few quiet seconds and everybody please think of the names of one or two living people that you would consider to be leaders. And then why, why don't you think, uh, why do you think of that name? So what are some of the uh, qualities or attributes uh, that you associate with, with being a good leader? And how about if I give you 30 seconds back? Why don't you just share the names and qualities that you're thinking of with one or two people close by, and then I'll get your attention back again. OK, have a, have a chat. OK, friends, let's uh, pull ourselves back together. Uh, why don't we hear a name or two? What, what was the name that, that came up right now? Pope Francis. Pope Francis, OK. Let's have another name. Mitt Romney. Mitt Romney. OK, great. Uh, so uh, why, do we think of, why do we think of these names? Uh, so what were some of the qualities or attributes that, that came up in your little chats now? Uh, sense, uh, to be present to people, okay, to, to be present, to some sense of presence. What else? Steady, did you say? Okay, to be steady, in other words, consistent or something like that. Okay, well, let's keep going. To be somebody that other people trust. To be open-minded. To be charismatic, and maybe one more. To be courageous. Okay, beautiful. Um, so let me talk a bit. So who, so who are leaders? People thought of interesting names. Uh, I wonder who thought of their own name. I guess nobody, probably next to nobody. Or you know, if you thought of your own name, probably you didn't turn to the people next to you and say me. You know? <laughs> Who's a leader? Who's a leader? Pope Francis, Mitt Romney, and me. You know? uh, we're raised in a culture that teaches us to be modest people, and modesty is important. Uh, but I want to suggest that if we understand leadership correctly, your modesty somehow is misplaced because we have a broken stereotype of what leadership actually is. In other words, when we play this mental game and I say think of the names of leaders, we think of people who are at the absolute pinnacle of their respective profession. I mean, people didn't think of a bishop, a cardinal, well, the pope, you know, and, and so on. And this stereotype of leadership that it's only uh, about the absolute top famous people is not the solution to any problems in Georgetown and my old J.P. Morgan in life. It's part of the problem. And in some ways, the first people you need to think about as leaders are yourselves. And I would demonstrate it in two ways. Here's the first way. Let's just think about what you told me. When we thought of the names of leaders, we tended to think of famous people. But I was listening as you enumerated qualities of leadership. And there wasn't a single idea that was mentioned that everybody here could not uh, role model tomorrow. Um, you know, people told me things like to, to be willing to listen, to be courageous, to have some sense of presence, to be consistent and steady. Every single idea was an idea that everybody here could role model. 
And I would, I would try to demonstrate it another way. If we looked in a dictionary, we'd see different definitions of the word leadership. But those definitions uh, would always include one like this. To point out a way, direction, or goal, and to influence others toward it. And isn't it true that everybody here is doing those words all the time, you know? We're pointing out a way by virtue of the, the values, the habits that we role model here every day. You know, there's some people who really uh, work hard. Uh, there's some people who believe in developing their gifts. There are other people who are lazy. There are some people who would never cheat. There are other people who would cheat if they get away with it. And so we're pointing out a way and we're having some influence. And a, a few people here are probably parents and all of us have parents. And could there be any more obvious example of pointing a way and influencing others than what parents do for children over a lifetime, you know? So by the dictionary definition, not, not some gimmick of mine, good parenting also is good leadership. But though all of us are leading, most of us do so only subconsciously. In other words, we're not walking around all day thinking, oh, you know, I'm a leader and isn't that great? And I guess what I want to suggest is we need to be a little more purposeful, explicit about the fact that, you know, life has given me a, a leadership opportunity right now. You know, not 35 years from now if you become president of J.P. Morgan, but right now. Um, and so, uh, you know, I want to invite us to think about what sort of leadership statement we want to make with our lives, you know? And I also want to say this before I, I go a little bit further, that, you know, there's something, uh, a theme of what I'm going to be talking about is there's something about great leadership that's really deeply spiritual, you know? And when I say spiritual, I don't mean I'm a Muslim, Jewish, Christian. That's, that's not my point. But rather, you know, even, and I'm not just saying that because, oh, I'm in Georgetown. It's a Jesuit school. You have to say nice spiritual things as a priest there. Uh, you know, I talk to a lot of business people, I'd say the same thing. And this is the first way that I would introduce the topic. I'd say this, you know, look, uh, there's people here who study accounting, I'm sure. And we know that this place has value on the balance sheet of Georgetown University, huh? We, it's material. We could touch it. We could say it cost us this much to build it. We could depreciate over this many years. has value. How about the uh, staff and faculty who are here? What value do they have on the balance sheet of, of Georgetown University? Zero, right? Maybe a, little, maybe a little accrued pension, but basically zero. And any business person I've ever talked to me, uh, talked with, has agreed that in reality, the, the, the truth is exactly the opposite of the accounting treatment. That this place is worth, uh, this building is worth next to nothing unless the people who show up every day are willing to treat each other a certain way, have a certain dedication to the mission of the place, uh, role model certain values, know certain things, and none of those things is material, none of those things we could touch, none of those things we could put a dollar value on or put in a balance sheet. So in the, in the kind of gross uh, definitional sense, you know, there's something about the qualities that are most important in leadership that are not material, they're spiritual. And I want to talk to you in, in uh, some detail about one idea, but I'm going to introduce uh, four such ideas. And uh, some of you may know, I'm sorry, because if you have to read the book, I apologize. But you know, I don't decide what's the curriculum here. Um, and as, as some of you know, uh, I tried to think about uh, you know, my own life experience, both as a Jesuit and then in J.P. Morgan, and distill uh, qualities that it seems to me are not the formula for leadership, not the only values, not even the most important things, but some values that we might think about incorporating in our life leadership statement. And uh, these are the four I talk about in the, in the book. I'll just introduce four of them and talk about one. You know, first. Uh, to be heroic. In other words, that we would motivate ourselves with a real passion, a real desire to excel. But the more important aspect of it is with goals that are bigger than any one person's ego. And anyone, anybody who's worked in a big company knows that this is a really big challenge this day. In other words, at J.P. Morgan, we understood that we need a pile of people who are willing to commit some of their energy, some of their talent uh, to the mission of the firm that's bigger than any one of us. But we collect a whole pile of people who basically show up saying, hey, what's in it for me? How much am I going to make? How fast am I going to get ahead? And so on. And we don't need that in organizations. It's fine to be ambitious, but we need people who are somehow able to sublimate their ambition 
uh, to, the, to the mission of the place, to be somehow heroic. And secondly, uh, the idea of self-awareness, that I'm going to talk about. Uh, the idea of ingenuity, that we understand the fact that the world is going to keep changing. I'm sorry. And only people who have the willingness to keep adapting, are free to keep changing, can lead well and finally love. That we treat other people in a way that respects their uh, human dignity and tries to unlock their potential. I often uh, share this quote when I talk about leadership. Uh, somebody with great credentials said this, you must love those you lead before you can be an effective leader. And sometimes I ask people to guess, oh, what business do you think that guy was in? And people say, oh, you know, maybe there's somebody who like ran a, ran a hospital or uh, ran some kind of a, a nonprofit charity. Uh, that was Eric Shinseki. Until a few years ago, the guy was chief of staff, uh, highest ranking military officer in the United States. And the first time I heard it, that struck me as quite strange, coming from a military class that we all instinctively associate with macho, being tough. Or maybe, maybe not out of place, because then the more I thought about it, you know, the more I suspect that a general actually makes better choices if he loves the people he must place into difficulty. You know, and I also bet that a soldier performs better if he believes he's valued in a deep way by the people who have a terrible job of sending them out maybe to face their death. So those are uh, four ideas that I, that I introduced in the book and, and for about five minutes now that remain, I only want to talk about one of them, self-awareness, because I think uh, for, th for those of you at this stage of your life, in some ways it's the most important uh, concept to, to try to f uh, focus on. And uh, let, me, let me go at it this way, that anybody who's managed a lot of people or hired a lot of people, I did that when I was at J.P. Morgan, has been mystified by this phenomenon of rising junior talent who all of a sudden flames out. So, you know, at Morgan, uh, we hired very smart people because they all wanted to come to Wall Street and get rich, you know, and uh, everybody did very well when the only thing that we asked them to do was move numbers around Excel spreadsheets. But always, uh, some of them blew up as soon as we started to ask them to do grown-up things, like dealing with other human beings or dealing with problems that don't have easy solutions. And one of the things you quickly realize in adult life and business life, and that many of you are realizing, I'm sure, is that many problems don't have easy solutions, and many problems have no solutions. And so you need people who have uh, good judgment and courage. You know, Judgment meaning, for example, OK, look, this is the problem we have. and. Uh, uh, it seems to me we have these three possible ways of going forward here, and, well, I can't prove that any one of them is the right way, but I have my reasons, good judgment, for thinking this is the best. And then they're courageous. They're willing to say, okay, boom, this is where we go. Even though I know I might be wrong, and if I'm wrong, there are going to be 50 people behind me who think I'm uh, a little stupid. But they're willing to take the risk of making a decision. And I'm sure you've already seen in life, you know, one of the great crucibles in leadership is who's willing to make a decision. There are a lot of people who are afraid. Um, and there's a school of thought that attributes this inability to develop judgment and courage sometimes to a lack of a certain kind of self-awareness. In other words, what sometimes happens, and now I talk exactly to the kind of people who are sitting in a room like this, what sometimes happens is very smart people quickly figure out how to do school, but never until it's too late figure out how to do life. And what I mean is this, that precisely because you're so smart, sometimes, especially in the early uh, stages of school, uh, it comes too easily to you. And you kind of get it down. I mean, you know how to give back to teachers what they want. And you know, you're popular with other classmates. You're popular with teachers. And you never really experience the kind of failing, setback, challenge, difficulty that forces people to develop what in corporate life we used to call learning agility to be agile, in other words, to learn new things, to uh, accept feedback from other people without getting defensive. Um, to, f to fail and keep going, these sort of things. There's a guy who uh, uh, worked at Harvard, taught at Harvard Business School decades ago, Abraham Zelznik, and he also worked as what we today would call an executive coach, in other words, with chief executives giving them advice. And he made a very interesting observation that a large share of these uh, executives, in his words, were twice born. 
really interesting phrase. He didn't mean it in a religious sense that, that we might guess. Rather, this is what he meant, that he noticed how many of them early in their adulthoods had suffered some kind of a crisis. You're an alcoholic, you get fired, your family breaks, I don't know, whatever it is. And this experience totally knocks them down and makes them say, you know, look, who the hell am I anyway and what do I want out of my life? And his thesis was that, in fact, that explained their long-term success because it ended up giving them a very solid core, you know, a sense of, okay, look, this is who I am. This is what I think life is about. This is what I stand for. And anybody who's tried to do something really difficult or ambitious knows that if you don't have a solid core, you can't do it because, um, I don't know what, you know, we start out, we run into trouble, things don't go well, people resist us, and, you know, if you don't have this, you fold. Um, you know, so we need people who've made a deep investment in their own self-awareness and understanding who they are and what they're about. And I hope you can kind of infer the implications for you guys when I tell this little story. But if you can't, let me unpack it in two or three ways. Here would be one way. That if life doesn't force us through a crisis to do some kind of self-scrutiny, that we would create a process for ourselves of doing that you know, understanding who we are and what life's about. And that's why I think people who come to a school like this have huge competitive advantage. I'm not just saying it because I'm here. I, I really believe it. it. Like in this respect, for example, uh, I guess almost everybody here is a business school major, and you have peers that are uh, going to other schools, and if they want to load up on uh, 70 business classes, they can do that. And you come here, I think you have to study some philosophy and theology and literature and history. And half of you are saying, oh man, what a pain in the ass. I just want to study business. And what I'm saying is, no, look, my friend, you're being given an opportunity in life to figure out what, what does it mean to be a human being? How should we treat other human beings? You're doing the self-awareness work that some people don't learn until it's too late. And here's another competitive advantage. Uh, you come to a place like this, uh, you can also follow your spiritual pathway to, uh, to kind of understanding in some deeper way who you are and, wh and what life is about. And let me also say this, that I hope nobody here has been through a, a crisis in their life. But I bet if we went around this room and we started to hear people's secret resumes, you know, the kind of things you don't tell your best friends, we would hear that there are a lot of people who've had some real difficulty in life. There are people here who've come uh, from very difficult family situations, people here who've had substance abuse problems in their life or somebody else's life. There are people here who found it very difficult to fit into this place. And popular culture is kind of telling us this, this, these are the things we ought to be ashamed of. You know, this is going to be our big anchor in life that holds us back. And, and I guess what I'm saying, well, not just what I'm saying, but also what you know, some of the research <coughs> Uh, tells us is that for many of us, this experience of going through challenge can be the source of our great power. You know, if, if we use it as a moment to say, okay, well, look, you know, I'm still here. I made it. And what did I learn about myself? And what did I learn about what I think is important? And, and so on. So we all uh, need to make a, a deep um, investment in, in, uh, in our own self-awareness, and then we also need to have uh, some little mechanism to help us uh, stay on track every day on how's it, how's it going. And I just wanna, for, can I talk for two more minutes? Introduce um, uh, a tool that uh, Jesuits use to do that that you could choose to use if you wish. Um, so the founder of the Jesuits uh, tells them, and I guess by extension invites us, that every day you could take a couple of little mental pit stops. So let's imagine uh, five minutes after lunch and then five minutes at the end of the day. And in those five minutes, I'm just going to do three little things. Uh, one, I'm going uh, to remind myself why am I grateful as a human being. You know, you, come to, you get to a, into a school like Georgetown, probably you're a type A. You know, your whole life is, this is what I got to do. This is the problem. I got to solve the problem. And, you know, that's why we end up, you end up being high achievers. But it's also why you drive yourself and everybody else nuts, you know? <laughs> And so instead, for a moment, uh, let me just think, why am I grateful to be alive? And then also, let me lift my horizon a bit. In other words, we tend to live like six inches off the ground. After we turn this text, there's the music playing, I really like it, there's what I want to have to lunch. Uh, and you know, forget about that, and let's just think 60,000 feet. Why am I here on Earth anyway? Or I had a conversation with myself on January 1st that I need to, 
focus on certain things. And let me remind myself of that. And then third, I'm just going to go back through the last few hours of the day and try to take away some little lesson that might help in the next few hours. Like, I don't know why, I was irritated all morning. I lashed out at her. She had nothing to do with it. It's my issue. So let me process that and get back in the game, you know? Or if I'm a spiritual person, I might go back through the last few hours and try to perceive how a uh, God or a higher power, as I understand that, was, was present in, in my life, you know? And I think the genius of this real, you know, so the, this was from the founder of the Jesuits, like 400 years ago. For him, of course, it was a religious thing. And it is a religious thing. But it also has a powerful human payoff, you know? Um, because uh, think about the, w the world we're all trying to live now. You know, we're kind of floating along on this river of email, meeting, text, phone call, m discussion, interruption, and we're sort of present to every crazy stimulus, but not to the things that are ultimately most important. So I think I could say that, you know, the tradition of your school has given you some real competitive advantage in life. Uh, you know, that's not the way the Jesuits would phrase it, but that's the way I could, I could present it. So, uh, you know, I've overstayed the time I was supposed to talk, I think, by, by two or three or four minutes. So I apologize uh, for that. Um, but let me say, uh, you know, look, I know everybody is really busy. You have very, uh, uh, you have a lot of things you have to do. So I appreciate that people would come. And I, and I wish everybody the best of luck as you make, you know, yourself and Georgetown and your families and the companies you end up working at places where really great leadership happens. So thank you very much for listening. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Father Patrick Rogers. I am a Jesuit priest here on campus, and for nine years I was the director of campus ministry for the main campus. And uh, I was on sabbatical last year, and now I'm back doing writing my doctoral thesis. But I've been greatly involved with a lot of programs mm -hmm. from the business school, uh, a proud chaplain at this school for many years, and uh, it's really a delight uh, to be here. I want to thank Chris for, for uh, just a wonderful and inspiring talk. And uh, again, thank you for sharing your wisdom with us. If you don't know what the book looks like that he's talking about, it's called Heroic Leadership, Best Practices from a 450-Year-Old Company that Changed the World. And I have read it, it underlines all over the place. I've, I read it when it first came out. I've actually taught it. And so uh, it's just a real joy and a pleasure to be able to talk with you about it. So let's unpack a little bit of what you said, especially about self-awareness. Uh, because that seems to be uh, the key for what you're saying. How would heroism or ingenuity uh, or being a loving person flow out of that foundational uh, pillar of self-awareness? Okay, so... Uh, so, um, so I was a, a Jesuit seminarian, and you know, one of the things that's interesting about the way Jesuits train people is uh, you know, technical training. You know, like if you're, I'm going to teach economics or I'm going to do, that's the absolute last thing you do, as you would know very well, but uh, many of the folks wouldn't know. And really, you spend most of your time in training as a Jesuit, reflecting on yourself and learning tools to, for that. And so then I was doing that, and then, I end up at, and then I'm at J.P. Morgan. And, and in J.P. Morgan, like in, in the corporate world generally, it's 100% the opposite. Mm. The, only thing we, uh, the only thing we spend time on are technical skills. You know, how to do present value, how to calculate bond prices, how to value, whatever the heck it is, you know? And one of the things that, uh, you know, quickly became apparent in life is that not every problem can be solved by looking at comparing present values, you know? And then you see a lot of people, they're kind of lost. They don't have tools to sort of grapple with these kinds of issues and discussions and so on. So it, it, you know, it struck me that, that it, the, the contrast sort of struck me that, you know, something really a lot of the important, uh, Im, important aspects to doing well in organizational life are not technical skills. I mean, those are important. I mean, if, you don't, if you're here studying accounting, if you can't do accounting well, then forget it. We don't need you. Uh, but that's like the ticket into the game, you know? And then the rest of the, the problems are, pff, how can I get these people to do what we need to do? Or how can I uh, make her feel more confident so she could do her work? Or how can we, uh, how can we 
uh, get ourselves uh, open and free to kind of turn our company upside down and go in a totally different direction when people hate to change. And all of those things ultimately, to me, have something to do with you know, who we are and how we understand ourselves and how we understand our own um, inherent weaknesses or resistances or how we think we ought to interact with humans and so on. So yes, I kind of feel like in a way uh, self-awareness is, is an important uh, key to a lot of a lot that's really important in, in leadership and organizational life. And, and that's very hard work, obviously. Uh, any of you who have done any kind of uh, you know, self-reflective work, I mean, it's, it's, you've got to dig deep, you know, and you have to, you have to really be honest with yourself. Uh, yeah, and, and, you re and you realize you don't finish. Yeah. You know, like I, I learned how to compute uh, present value, and at a certain point I knew how to compute present value, you know, that was the end of it, you know. But in terms of Chris Lowney and how he's a screw up and how he interacts with people, I mean that, you, you know, you, you manage new people and you screw up in new ways, you know. So you end up uh, continually either, I don't know what, coming against your own weaknesses or discovering different things about, about yourself. It's, it's kind of a life project. I, I find that in my work with uh, young people, oftentimes they'll say something like that. They'll say, well, I, I, I'm not finished yet, or I don't have this, you know, I'm not this way yet. And so I'm just going to tell all of you, you're going to have it all figured out when you're in the grave. And that's, that's when it finally, you get it all figured out. And uh, so you don't have to worry about that. You're always in a process. Um, one of the things that you talked about, uh, the, the last thing you talked about, was this reflective uh, piece uh, we Jesuits call that the examination of consciousness. And St. Ignatius, uh, the founder of the Society of Jesus, said that this was so important for a Jesuit to do that it was even more important than going to Mass. <clears throat> because, again, the whole idea is if you are not self-aware about what's happening in your life, then, then the work you're going to be doing is just not going to be as fruitful. Or you're not going to be as happy or integrated. And, again... You know, Chris teases this out very well and very accessibly in this book. There's a reason it's a, it's a bestseller. It's because it just, it, it articulates these visions very, very well. So one of the things that, uh, about also that you say about loving, I find that that's an interesting thing. And you, you talk about that in your book. Uh, when you're being a leader, to, to be loving. Could you articulate a little bit more about how that's... Uh, how you see that articulated it, it, maybe on Wall Street or in your own businesses uh, or how they might articulate, use that word to, our, you know, to their advantage to, right. to do something. Okay, so um, maybe I could talk about using, using that word in the book. So you know, when I was writing the book, uh, you know, my idea was could I translate uh, ideas that sometimes Jesuits have these crazy arcane language for into... Um, words and ideas that would be accessible to all of us, you know, whether we're religious people or not, whatever is our thing. So that was my idea. And so I was looking for words like that. And, uh, you know, heroism, ingenuity, those words were kind of easy for me. And then I came down to this idea. And um, so that was a big problem for me, you know, because I used to think that the word that St. That Ignatius uses is you have to be loving, you know, you have to manage with greater love than fear, for example, is a thing he says, yeah. right? And um, that was a problem for me because I would think, you know, I didn't really write the book for people like you. I wrote the book for people my, like I was thinking of my colleagues at J.P. Morgan. And I would just picture these guys' faces and say, holy cow, what are they going to think of a word like that? And, but then I think, well, what else could I say? I said, well, maybe I can use the word respect, but I'm, it's a terrible thing to say this, but it's true. The reality now is that respect is in every company's value statement, but in half of the places, people feel like they're treated like animals. And so I apologize for saying this, but it's like bullshit. And I said, I can't use a word like that because everybody will just roll their eyes and say, oh yeah, I've seen that. So I say, okay, well, let me just use the word, you know? And um, so, you know, look, I mean, I didn't go around the hallways uh, of JP Morgan hugging people and telling them I loved mm, them, you know? Yeah. <laughs> And, uh, you know, the founder of the Jesuit said that love ought to manifest itself in deeds, not in words. And I think this is the best example I could give of really what the idea is about. I had, you know, I worked at J.P. Morgan for 17 years. I had great managers and terrible managers. And the terrible managers, you basically feel like you're a tool, you know? They want to get something done, and you're the hammer 
that's available to them right now. And then I have other managers and their faces are going through my, right, my mind right now that I felt, you know something? She wants me to really get ahead in this company. Not just politically, like she wants me to uh, do, uh, maximize my potential, to have the best career here I can. And that is deeply motivating, yeah, man. you know? And so that to me would be, what does loving mean? In other words, that she would say, oh man, you know, uh, this guy has potential and part of my job is to develop this guy's potential. Um, so I think as a kind of a humanistic thing, it's a, it's a way we ought to treat, you know, I would say from a moral perspective, that's how we treat people, but from a business perspective, I'd say, you know something, you treat people like that, they're, they're gonna give you much better productivity or value. You know, so I, I would also make the case that it's a business, there's a business reason mm -hmm. to do it, you know, not just a moral reason. I was, uh, just a, as an anecdote, I was away this last weekend on an uh, overnight retreat with one of our sports teams. And uh, one of the captains actually said that word when he was uh, talking to the players. He said, uh, you, know, I, you know, I really love you all very much. I want you to succeed. You know, I want us to be on the same page. I want us to have a vision for what we can do. And uh, I was just really very touched by that. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and I, I don't think he's read this, but it, 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 he might as well have because it came right out of that sense of where is the motivation coming from? You know, this deep sense of I, uh, I can articulate the word love because I want you to succeed. I want you to be an us and me more than, than we have been. Yeah. And it was pretty extraordinary. I thought it was really interesting. Yeah. And how might, um, again, you talk about this in your book, and, and, and we Jesuits try to, to uh, incorporate this into our lives, a sense of indifference. So a lot of times I think that could be a loaded word too. So why don't you unpack that word indifference for us and how that might be an advantage in leadership? Okay, so, um, so in the book uh, I, I, use, I talk about the idea of ingenuity. In other words, uh, the world's changing, we have to be able to change too. And so, you know, what, what do the Jesuits bring to the table there? And it seems to me, um, you know, what happens is that we, you know, when you're managing in a, a group, you're leading a group, you say, oh man, you know, the world is changing, can't you see what's going on out there, we need to change, and so on. And everybody knows that. And there are some people who are ready for that, there are other people who are quite terrified by that, and you just saying that changes nothing. You know, and I think part of the great Jesuit uh, insight, you use the word uh, indifference, mm -hmm. I, uh, you know, to kind of translate it uh, into a vernacular, use the word inner freedom. You know, in other words, like this idea that uh, w whenever I have a major choice to make, like I don't know what, should we merge the company? Should I marry the person? Uh, should, we, should we launch this whole new strategy? The idea is uh, that we have to be, make ourselves free before trying to make the decision. In other words, we can't uh, be so biased by, or so controlled by, uh, I don't know what, my fear of failure, uh, or my uh, ego or status, you greed. know, my greed, whatever, you know, whatever it may be. Um, and you know, we have to somehow understand if any of this inner baggage is going on inside us, and then, and then be able to identify that, and then hopefully put that aside and say, okay, fine, this is the issue, What's our mission? And boom, off we go. And one of the things that you realize a lot in organizational and corporate life is that people make terrible decisions, not because they're stupid, but because, to use this language, they're unfree. Mm -hmm. In other words, everything becomes, a, I mean, people don't say this explicitly, they don't even know this, but really what's controlling their decisions is, uh, oh, will this get me, a, uh, is this better for my status? Uh, what will this do for my bonus? Uh, my ego, so ego, greed, ambition, fear, that, rather than the goals or objectives of the organization, ends up becoming the driving thing. So to me, this is a great insight that the Jesuits really bring to our decision making, you know, the importance of getting ourselves free enough to be able to make good choices. Amen. And, and one of the things that, uh, one of the ways we articulate that as Jesuits is we say that we want to be contemplatives in action. So that means that before we make big decisions, you, you have to, to really cultivate an inner freedom and really think about and pray about the course forward. Um, 
we don't always get it right, but it does help to have some kind of a, a distance, uh, again, where ego or other things aren't in, as involved in the decision so that the decision can be just a clearer decision for everyone on board. And frankly, sometimes we have to call each other on that. You know, uh, you know I, I might want to make a decision about something and somebody might go, whoa, Pat, hold on a second. You know, you just came up with that. Why don't we think about that for a little bit? And 90% uh, of the time, they're right. You know, to take a little bit more time to cultivate that self-awareness, the inner freedom to make uh, a better decision. Uh, we have some questions that we're going to be taking uh, uh, from the audience here in just a moment. But, uh, you know, this is, you see them, the, this is, they're wonderful people out there. Uh, so they've come here to, to listen, listen to you. So if you wanted to... What advice would you give them for be, uh, having them actually do this cultivation, the self-awareness? Because I'm presuming that in the business world, there are a lot of managers that may not say, well, I don't want you to have the time off, or I'm just interested in this. Uh, for healthy living, what, what advice might you give them for this kind of self-awareness development? You know, um... Maybe I could maybe I could answer it indirectly in a different way. Um, so I get, I mean, if this is this is like if if this is like most great business schools, and I, I think it is from having spoken to uh, uh, Dr. Sharp, I think there are a lot of people uh, here who are probably finance majors, and they're going to end up on Wall Street, you know, mm -hmm. like I did. Uh, and sometimes people say, oh, you know, uh, I want to live a an ethical life, and I just read this thing in the Wall Street Journal about these crooks, at, you know, and can, what if I, can I really go to one of these places? And what I always say is, you know something, uh, I think you could have a great career in one of these places, you know, and you could be very well rewarded and deeply challenged and have a, a, an interesting life, but I always say, you know, you better not show up in, unless you have your head screwed on. Because, um, you know, these are places where you could get yourself into trouble and get the firm in trouble really fast. You know, and what happen, you know, what happens is, you know, we get people, we used to get people a lot of times that, you know, they only knew one thing, uh, I want to make a lot of money. Just tell me what to do, I want to make a lot of money. And those were very dangerous characters to, uh, you know, because you realized uh, they're, they're going to create problems for us. Um, and so now to kind of come to your question, I guess I feel like, you know, what is, the, to put it in the, in the kind of most gross vernacular way, what does it take to get your head screwed on? You know, like in other words, to me it means things like that you have some sense of, well, what's ultimate, what's, what's life about? What's important in life? How should we treat other people? Mm -hmm. And, you know, like all of us have these idealistic, nice answers to these kinds of things. But then it becomes hard when real life yeah. comes into play, you know. So somehow to be able to, one, have answered those questions a little bit, and hopefully Georgetown helps you to do that. But then also have some way of keeping yourself uh, balanced or focused when real life intrudes and you're getting sucked in one direction or another, you know? Yeah, I, 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 I know that uh, I've had friends that have worked on Wall Street and sometimes they don't even, they don't even know what questions to ask. They're, mm -hmm. just, they're just hell bent on whatever it is and uh, they're just so focused on something that they don't even take time to to even ask a question, is this what I should be doing? Or is this what I really want to do? Yeah, can I make a comment on that? Absolutely. So, you know, you work at a big place and, you know, a few people know your, know your background and so on. Most, you know, most people don't. It's a huge company. Uh, so, you know, most people at, at J.P. Morgan didn't know that I was a, a seminarian, a Jesuit seminarian. And then, um, so then I'm leaving Morgan and I'm going to be writing this book about the Jesuits. And so now all of a sudden everybody knows what Chris's background is. And probably in the last two weeks I was at Morgan, I probably had half a dozen closeted Jesuit graduates, you know, <laughs> come up to me and say, oh man, you know, uh, uh, oh yeah, I heard you were a Jesuit, I went to Georgetown, I love her, I went to the Ateneo de Manila in the Philippines. And, you know, it really struck me, you know, I, I, in a couple of ways. I kind of felt like, you know, something, we have this power here that we're not really exploiting. But in now, to, uh, this is what came to my mind when you were talking. I also sort of felt, you know something? It would have helped me to, know, to have known this all these years, you know? And you work in big companies, and it can, they can be very lonely places, you know? And 
I, I somehow had this feeling at that moment of a kind of a loss or a longing, you know, like, you know, like if, if I had had a group that we had sat together every week or something like that and just said some of these things like, oh, this is what's going on and what do you think about this? And, you know, my point is by no means to say that people who went to Jesuit schools have something more or better than anyone else, but somehow, you know, one of the ways we keep our heads screwed on straight is if we can find a community of people who believe like we think mm. we do in things that we think are important about how life should be lived and then use that as a kind of a life raft, you know, that we kind of have a beer together or we pray together, do whatever the heck we do, you know, that helps us to support each other and process, gee, what the heck, what, what just went on there, you know, and how should we think about that? Yeah, it's wonderful. And by the way, uh, after, after uh, we're finished, uh, I do have some, uh, again, Chris talked about the, refle the reflective piece, and uh, I do have some cards that if anyone's interested on, on the examination of conscience that come from the mission and ministry department. And they're really nice. Again, we Jesuits do this every, every evening, every day after uh, lunch, you know, reflect on our day. And a lot of people have found a lot of, you know, just uh, a lot of peace in that because it helps us focus on the task ahead and, again, have bigger horizons, but then help us focus on the task of what's going on. So we're going to take some questions. We'd like to have some questions from maybe some of the students who are in the seminar who have read the book. And I don't know where the microphones are. I don't see them. Oh, they are? I, I guess the lights are. I see are... standing there. Yeah. yeah. So if, if you have a question, please uh, come and introduce yourself and uh, ask your question. Okay. Uh, hello, I'm, I'm Antonia. I'm a sophomore in the business school. And uh, my team and I were starting a free leadership workshop for high school students. What do you think I'm sorry, would say be. Say again? You're starting what? Uh, a free leadership workshop for high school students. Great. What do you think will be the top three most important thing to teach those kids in a period of one day? <laughs> okay, so uh, I mean that is great that you that is great that you're doing that, you know. And so it'll be no matter what happens, it'll be successful, just by virtue of the fact that you're doing it. Whatever happens, you know. Um, I don't know about the three things, but what come to my mind would be one. Uh, uh, to get them to appreciate that they have a leadership opportunity now. Because the problem is, you're going to be telling them, oh, leadership, blah, 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 and they're going to be thinking of, oh, yeah, if this will come in handy if I become Barack Obama someday, you know? <laughs> and so I think that's really hard, you know, to help people to appreciate, you know, just the way I started out, to help people appreciate that, no, you know, we're pointing out a way now, you know, yeah, we're doing something else. That'd be one thing. And then, I don't know, this, the, only, uh, the other thing that would come to mind, I guess I'm basically telling you about my own life when I say this, is that I feel like, um, you know, uh, people often have incredible risk. You know, one of the, one of the I had a mentorish guy at Morgan who once uh, said to me, you know what was the best thing that happened to me here? Uh, the first important decision I had to make in life, uh, I totally, or in, in Morgan, I totally screwed it up. And I say, oh, best thing? He says, yeah. You know, nobody died. Uh, we fixed it up. And since then, I've never been afraid to make a decision. And I feel, and when he said that, it really struck me, you know, because I realized how, how my whole life was governed by fear of making a mistake, risk aversion. And may, I, I don't know how easy it would be to convey that idea to young people, but to me, it's been an important thing in my life, you know? And of course, when I say, willingness to take risk. I don't mean uh, being reckless or stupid and so on. You know, you'd have to convey that. But uh, the sense of, you know, in life you have to go for it. Mm. You, you know what I mean? And I don't know who these kids are, but, you know, maybe their sense of what's possible for them in life is very modest. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So to help people uh, say, no, you know, you can set a, a higher target and who cares if you're going to, I mean, you're gonna, you are going to fail. Mm. In life we all fail. You know, but there's something about the willingness to uh, take risk and go for it that I think to me is important in, in leadership. Thank you very much. Yeah. Hi, um, my name is Adrian, I'm a freshman. And my question was, you said that good leaders help, uh, or yeah, help their, the people they're leading 
be as successful as they can be uh -huh. in, and, and I, I want to know what in, what in your in your words or in your opinion what that means if it's yeah at, let's say it seemed to me that it was being successful at the company and what does that mean or maybe it's being successful as a person yeah I just wanted your opinion okay so yeah I mean I guess in a way you're asking me more profoundly than I than I uh, meant it when I said it you know I mean what I when I said it I was thinking primarily in terms of um, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm managing you guys, and part of my job is to help you uh, understand, to help you, to help you develop your potential. You know, and maybe this guy, uh, you know, maybe he has a lot of talent. You know, his problem is that uh, he really needs more confidence, and so, you know, so that's how I'm going to help him develop his potential. And you know, this guy, uh, he really needs direction. You know, I need to help him understand this is where you need to go, and. And maybe this guy, maybe he's kind of lazy. I need to kick his ass. You know, that's how I'm going to help him develop his. So that's the context in which I was thinking of it. But I guess, you know, I, you know the way you asked the question is very good, you know, because I suppose, I mean, I can't say I really approach my job this way. But I guess you could say the, the noblest managers of all would be people who are thinking of us in terms of human beings and how we flourish in all aspects of life, you know. And I... As a manager, I didn't really take that on a lot. Maybe I, maybe I should have. Certainly, I, you know, at least in this respect, I would say I felt like I was sensitive to what was work doing to somebody's life. That as a minimum. You know, like in other words, you could see people that were obviously unhappy or, you know, their, life, their work was obviously tearing them apart. And, you know, I think you have to do something about that. Um, yeah, so maybe, a, I, I don't know if I totally answered your question, or you gave me something to think about, you know? Thank you. Yeah. Who are the most heroic kinds of managers, in a way, you're, you're saying? Any other questions in, in general? Seems like you've answered all questions. <laughs> <laughs> but again, that idea, uh, again, Chris talks about this a lot in his book, and he talked about it here in, in his talk. Again, this idea of, of developing your own leadership. Uh, those of us of a certain age, that means middle age, for you young people, uh, we've all encountered uh, very, very clever people. There are a lot of clever and smart people out in the world that can do a job well. Great leaders uh, don't just happen. You know, Great leaders, it takes work. And uh, so start using those skills now and uh, develop your self-awareness, develop your capacity for heroism and love and ingenuity. And, um, you know, and then when you get older, those things, you know, people will recognize those things in your life and, um, and you will be picked for those. People will say, well, she or he's a natural leader and uh, this is who we need to, to help our organization. So uh, if there are no more questions, again, we're gonna, Chris, thank you so much, I'm sorry? Oh, there is. I'm sorry. Oh, please come to the microphone. Sorry. It's actually it's hard to see with the, something with these lights. Absolutely. Hi. Thanks for being here. Um, I was wondering if you meditate or have considered meditation for the matter of, you know, building self-awareness and kind of that self-consciousness. And if not, you know, what other tools would you recommend um, to reach that? Okay, great. So, you know, in a way, uh, thank, I thank you for asking that question because it gives me a chance to say this, that, you know, I stand up here and say uh, this is really important and you got to do this. That doesn't mean that I'm the exemplar of what I talk about, you know? I mean, I think a lot of times or sometimes in life, the things we say to other people are the things we really need to say to ourselves, you know? So uh, I said, you know, look, uh, I see the value of doing this every day, but it doesn't mean I do it every day myself, you know? And I guess, um, I guess here's how I'd answer your question directly, you know, that uh, I'm aware um, increasingly of like the research that's developing on, uh, you know, mindfulness techniques and meditative techniques. And it's very impressive, you know, how it's correlating with people's sense of well-being, greater productivity, all these things, you know? Now, 
uh, it's not, uh, you know, it's, it's not my own habit, so it's not what I grew up with, so I, I, I kind of don't go down that road. But I guess what I would say is, look, I mean, if this is what's comfortable for you and this works, then boom, this is what you have to do, you know? Uh, since you asked the question, I'd say what I do do every day is, uh, I, I hope, uh, by the way, I hope everybody understood, I am in no way talking about my religious tradition, huh? We're having a general conversation here, but now I answer something that has to do with my own religious tradition just because it comes up. What I do do is, uh, without a doubt, is, uh, you know, every morning um, I have a little uh, prayer reflective book that I um, use and I feel like that frames my, uh, that frames my day really well. Uh, I'm married now and uh, my wife and I do that together if we're both in city and that's a very, that's a very powerful thing. I never thought, you know, I, I'm sure there are people who are in relationships, you know, and I never dated somebody that I prayed with. And now, you know, I'm with somebody that, uh, you know, we can do that together. And that's great. That's a very powerful, energizing thing, too. Thank you. So some, some final comments? Yeah, so, so thank you. If I, if I just could take two more minutes. I have one last, if you don't mind, I just share one last idea that I would have shared in, in the talk, but I was afraid of the time. And look, let me, uh, I, wanna, uh, I wanna show you a quote, I'll let you read it, and then I wanna make a comment about it. Uh, so, you know, look, I mean, you're, you're all too young, I remember when this guy came out of jail. And I remember those first few months, and let me tell you, that was an incredible performance, you know? And I remember looking at that guy and thinking, holy cow, I mean, what natural courage and charisma this guy has. I mean, what a show. And then many years later, um, many years later, I was reading something and I see this quote. And I feel like he was smacking me in the head, you know, as if he was saying, okay, you know, uh, Chris, like your hypothesis is that uh, everything in South Africa uh, came easily to me, you know, because I have all this natural charisma and courage and everything else. Uh, no, look, I'm sorry, uh, I was afraid. Uh, so Chris, now tell me what's your big excuse in life. And let me tell you something, you know, I've, I've been fortunate enough to work with many successful people in more than one industry, and I could tell you, I, I mean, I don't know everybody's story, but in the few cases where I know people's stories, I can tell you this, everybody's afraid, and nobody has enough self-confidence. You know, the people who have enough self-confidence are the narcissists, and, and they're not the solution here, you know? They're part of the problem. Um, but I tell you that self-awareness is important, and you know, if you have a, a, even an iota of self-awareness, one thing that it brings to you is an awareness that, well, you know, I'm a screw-up. I mean, that's just the way it is, you know? And, uh, you know, we're kind of become very aware of things we're not good at, and life puts us in situations where we don't feel entirely skilled and qualified or confident as we wish we would be. And to me, you know, leadership, your leadership formation is not like you're gonna read this or go through that, and then one morning you wake up and boom, okay, man, I uh, have all the confidence I need, and I'm gonna run into Georgetown and really make a big contribution. Um, sorry, it doesn't work that way. You know, to me, the reality is that we just always have our own fears and confidence issues and doubts, um, but that we accept, okay, look, you know, I'm also smart, and I actually have some uh, real talent, and I have some wisdom. I've learned things in the course of my life, and people have shown confidence in me. I mean, you got accepted into this place, and you get a job, people will have said, okay, look, I think you can do the job here and that we honor the confidence people have in us and, you know, despite whatever fears or issues we have, that we would still run in there and say, okay, uh, boom, I'm gonna make my very best uh, contribution, so. Yeah. Well, on behalf of Georgetown University and McDonough School of Business, we thank you so much for being with us and for your inspiring words. <laughs>